Welcome, everyone. My name is Robert Jan van Pelt. I guess most of you know me, but those few who don't, I teach in this school. And um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome our alumnus and uh, friend and ex-student uh, Omer Arbel from Vancouver. Um, one of the great things of teaching in a place like this is that every year uh, we, we, we select our students, we, we have interviews, we, we have people, I mean, until the, the pandemic coming to the school with their portfolios. Of course, writing praises, which I have the pleasure or not that great pleasure to mark. And you see such an incredible amount of promise, uh, joy, uh, and of course also anxiety uh, streams through this building. And then it is our incredible privilege to be able to, in some way, create a community, choose the people we want to live with for the next five, six years, and then, as in this case, 30 years. So um, it was a very strange day when um, Omer came to interview uh, in 1994. And I remember it very well because it was the first day of the interviews. And um, I was staying here in town, and uh, uh, the interviews were about to start. And we heard there was a big accident on the 401, and no traffic was moving at all. And of course, all the faculty members who were living in Toronto were stuck somewhere in a pileup and couldn't come. And suddenly we had no, uh, no people to interview. We had students who had arrived the day before uh, to interview, but suddenly we didn't have panels. So we had to re, uh, recreate the panels. And instead of having four people in every room, we only had two. And the first student, uh, and I, we basically, I was there alone with a student, and the first person who walked in was Omer. Uh, so, uh, so I was kind of very tense still because uh, I didn't know how this day would go with no faculty members present. But it, 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 it turned out to be, uh, I must say, my anxiety immediately left when Omer started to present his work. It was one of the very best interviews I, uh, I, I ever sat through. Uh, I was excited from the, from the moment he walked in. Uh, I didn't really know why. I mean, it was, it was kind of, I had a feeling that he was kind of a little crazy, that he was kind of out of control. And some of you know that I like kind of things to be in control. But I felt that uh, that here was a person with, with a vision. And it was kind of a vision that was larger than me. And it was also a vision that I thought was larger than himself. And that maybe this school could uh, help him to, in some way, discover what that vision was. So we're now here, what is it, 28 years later, I think. Uh, uh, it's incredible uh, journey Omer has made, uh, and let's be honest, it's almost all without, uh, let's say, the input of this school. He left here in 2000 with uh, the B arts degree and uh, had the life of great adventure in architecture, in the arts, in, 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 in creating uh, marvelous uh, industrial products. And, uh, but uh, has returned also back to architecture. He's working now again as an architect, has his own firm. And um, I think that tonight uh, we're going to get in some way the, 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 current, the current project of, of self-discovery, I think, and of, of uh, understanding what his vision really is, that vision that for the first time I realized existed in 1994, and which I now really uh, very much enjoy to have seen unfold over the years in the most unexpected way. So Omer, welcome back to the school. I know you've never really, this building is not a building where you went to school, but I hope that you will be as home here as you ever was in the green room and the gray room uh, on campus. And uh, the audience is, you, is yours, except for one thing. I understand that at the lecture yesterday you gave at the University of Toronto, every student was instructed to come with a question. And that's how many students were 120 students and you got 120 questions. So I would love afterwards uh, to open the floor to all of you who have questions. Frank, uh, certainly I, I count on you for the first question. 
But after that, um, if I think we, we probably should try to leave it maybe to maximum of 40 questions. 40, maximum of 40 questions. So, uh, Omer, the floor is yours and uh, good luck. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. Um, it's nice to be back here, even though the building's a little bit different. I, uh, I chose to show, um, you see in the, in the lower, in the lower, I, I number my projects in chronological order. So the numbers you see here represent each one a project. And we don't really discriminate between uh, scale or program. Uh, I think my laser pointer is not working, but that's okay. So on the right, you'll see small numbers, and those are explorations at the scale of an object. And the reason I'd like to start with those is because that's what I did after I graduated um, for 15 years, or longer, probably 17 years. I sort of abandoned architecture. I gave up on it, even though that's what I wanted to do when I was a kid. Um, and uh, and then and then later, only in the last five years or so, we've been starting to come back to architecture at the scale of a house. And those are the numbers on the right: 75, 91, and 94. So, uh, and it's 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 interesting because the the sort of way of working that we developed um, at the scale of an object, as it migrates towards the scale of a building. We're not sure if it works. Uh, we're committed to it. Uh, and so uh, you'll see three attempts, let's say, at exploring what we've dis discovered or developed as a method um, at the scale of an object into architecture. Uh, fundamentally, we, we established a process where the, the physical, chemical, or mechanical properties of materials uh, teach us about form. So in other words, we try to really uh, encourage materials to teach us. Uh, so imagine, um, imagine not starting a project with a preconceived notion or intent, and instead, uh, instead developing a kind of open-ended method. I'll show you a few object-scaled works that are like this to explain what I'm talking about. Here's 64. Uh, it's uh, an explore exploration of wax. This is beeswax. I think I, I'll skip ahead a bit just to make the lecture shorter. You take wax and melt it. Uh, at the same time, you freeze a chunk of ice and shatter it into small bits. Place them in a drum. This is a Home Depot drum, but we've since created a stainless steel, much bigger rotating drum on wheels, fill it up with water, spin it, and pour the hot wax into the middle. And you're already seeing what's happening. The centrifugal force is pushing the wax out to the extreme ends of the drum, and it's cooling as it's being drawn out to the edges. And after this is done, we very carefully take out the piece and melt the ice. And you can see these very, very fine tendrils of wax resulting from the process. So it's almost impossible to transport this candle from one side of the room to another, let alone to a collector uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, and so we developed a method of shipping them, which involves basically casting them into ice cubes. So we refreeze them into this enormous ice cube and we ship the ice cube, ice cube. And there's a very sophisticated infrastructure for shipping frozen goods for restaurants. Uh, so when a collector buys one of these, they get this cube of ice and they have to wait for three days for the ice to melt. And then they get to have their candle. 71 is, uh, so this, it's enormous here on the screen, but it's, uh, it's only four inches tall. It starts its life as a machine bolt, hollow in the middle. 
and we wrap copper cable haphazardly by hand around the shaft of it. And then we uh, uh, apply an electroplating process. So this is a conventional process, basically creates an electromagnet. And if you played with magnets and iron filings as a kid, possibly, you'll know that uh, an electromagnetic field is shaped more or less like a lemon that you see here with two open ends, or another analogy is a candy wrapper. The, the two open ends are on the north and south pole of the magnet with this uh, arcing shape in the middle. And that's essentially what happens inside of electroplating vats. Electroplating is a conventional method of coating one kind of metal with a very thin layer of another kind of metal. Um, but we discovered that if we supercharge the electrical current through the emulsified metal solution in the vats and repeat the dipping motion literally hundreds of thousands of times, in this case you see a, a guy doing it, but now we have a robot, we get these interesting accretions begin to develop on the machine bolts. And we didn't really understand the science behind it when we did it, but now in retrospect we do. What's happening is that there's a, oops. There's a haphazardly shaped electromagnetic current. This one's dead, oh well. There's a haphazardly shaped electromagnetic current because we wrap the pieces by hand. That results in a strange shape. And the nickel particles accrete on the extreme ends of that electromagnetic field. So instead of that perfect lemon shape, there's a very strange three-dimensional form. And the, the metal accretes over hundreds of thousands of iterations on that edge. We string them up in what we call garlands or necklaces. Uh, and we imagine that they're almost kind of a jewelry for a room. You can sort of see the hexagonal heads of the machine bolts if you look carefully. I included this slide because in this case, the electromagnetic force was so strong inside the solution that it pulled the wires off of the bolt and even accreted on the ends of the wire. And so now we're, we, we feel this is a sort of amazing discovery and we were, we're exploring other metals. Here's uh, a gold ring. Uh, so now we thought, why, why jewelry only for rooms? It should be for people too. Uh, here's a ring uh, and a silver bangle. And you can sort of see how the um, shape of the accretions, accretions changes um, as you change the, the metal that, that you're using. 87 is a light. It's made of these uh, very, very fine strands of glass with air in between them. It's made by um, embedding a moil of glass, a very hot blob of glass, with as much air as we could possibly pack into it. We do this by dipping it into soda water. And then packing a lot of heat into it and letting it kind of drip. And then folding it. So in a very similar process to noodle making or toffee making. Every time we fold the glass matrix, each one of those bubbles gets stretched out into a strand and folded over itself. And every time you do it again, you have half the diameter of that sort of channel of air. And as you can see, it's achieving a kind of opalescence on the seventh or eighth fold. The last step is to drape it over a peg. And that peg corresponds in diameter to the eventual piece of hardware that we house the light bulb in. So 108, uh, these are fulgurites. Fulgurites are uh, naturally occurring uh, when lightning hits sand on a beach, silica sand, the heat that's ex ex sort of um, emitted from the passage of electricity to the ground creates these hollow, very mute minerals. 
And we thought, okay, well, we should make our own. Um, and so we began with small amounts of electricity, whatever we had in the studio. And we basically just sort of zapped the glass powder that we have that we melt. And these are about three inches. Uh, and then we started incorporating uh, trace metals. In this case, you see copper. And again, you see how the form cha changes dramatically. Uh, and also you get this fantastic color. And then we started reaching out to lightning research departments. Uh, this is the University of Florida has a, a lightning research department and they built this machine, which is essentially a cannon that fires a javelin, um, copper javelin into the sky during a thunderstorm. And it's connected to a cable that draws the lightning back down to the ground so that they could study it. And uh, what we're working on now is a collaboration with them where we basically provide these giant canisters of our magic formula of glass and copper and other trace metals and uh, use their machine to capture lightning bolts and direct them into our matrix. So what we're hoping to achieve are tree scaled versions of the little fulgurites you saw that we made. They'll have transparency and color. Hundred and thirteen is probably the most recent project. We showed it last summer at a gallery in Athens. It begins with a conventional glass blowing. Uh, I I don't uh, prescribe the forms. The glass blowers decide what they want to make. And we sort of pull it. And then pour liquid copper into it. Glass and copper have a vastly distinct coefficient of expansion, which we accentuate in, in the recipe making, so that while they're hot, they remain sort of, they sort of remain fused. But as soon as they start cooling, they do so at different rates. And the result is over 10 minutes, a kind of shattering of the glass. And you're left with uh, a sort of shadow of the original form that the glass blowers made. There's a beautiful iridescent quality to the metal, which we figured out was a result of some trace metals in the mix. Copper wasn't pure. So since then, we've started throwing bits of things into the mix just on purpose to get an even more iridescent texture. So now you see how we work. And this, this, this is a kind of 15 year trajectory that I've condensed for you. We always try to develop a technique. We don't control the form. We let the technique bring the form. Um, and to imagine how that might uh, how that might work at the scale of architecture was a challenge because architecture is so much more complex than an object. An object can be about one idea, but a building has to be about a hierarchy of ideas. Uh, in addition, there's so many more people that work on a building, and there are many sort of external factors to be considered. It has to not leak, it has to stand up. There's building codes, there's municipalities. I'll show three attempts, 75 being the first. Um, and we were sort of inspired by Mark West, a kind of a guy who worked in the University of Manitoba for 10 years ago, who explored fabric formed concrete. My critique of concrete is that by and large, we use it in this way that completely undermines its fluid or dynamic quality. We form it using predominantly wood forms into rectangular shapes. And we completely miss the fact that the, the material is dynamic fluid. So fabric forming is an idea that acknowledges the materials dynamic nature. 
Here are some experiments with spandex, spandex pants in our studio and plaster. Uh, this is a, a fresco I saw restored in a uh, space in New York, but I, I, was, I was taken by the, by the fabric shroud that they used to protect the, the fresco. And we developed this sort of reverse trumpet form that we first explored with uh, fabrics and plaster in our studio has this really nice edge when you cut it. And we started imagining what that might be like if it could contain the root ball of a mature tree. So in other words, giant suspended uh, planters. And miraculously, one of our clients agreed to make one. Uh, we proposed uh, a house made of these lily pads, what we called lily pads. And the question, that was asked as well, okay, I like the idea, but how much will it cost and how long will it take and what will they look like? And I couldn't answer any of them. So I said, oh, let's make one. Let's just make one. At the worst case, it'll just be a cool piece of sculpture in your garden. But if you like it and if it's not too expensive, we can build a whole house out of these. So you see there, uh, the, the fabric we used is called geotextile. It's used under road beds. It's a woven tarp, uh, inexpensive and very strong, and it's stretched between plywood ribs. And then, uh, maybe I'll skip ahead. Concrete is poured in. You don't see it quite because it's in this video, it's quite subtle, but the as the concrete's entering, the fabric swells out quite a bit. And because the fabric is woven, water wicks out of the, of the uh, geotextile, which is sort of an essential part of the process. So that's the first one we made. And here's a video I took of, uh, of it. Oops, should turn off the volume. It makes it made it made this strange form. It's like a kind of onion bulb or an onion or garlic maybe form. But we all sort of fell in love with it, including our client. Uh, so we made more and we developed a, a, a plan for a house that incorporated nine of these pieces. The water table on the site is quite high, so we couldn't excavate. And it's meant that we could only work in section above ground. And so we deployed them in such a way that they that you were always passing under and over them and that there was always a cadence of foreground, background, and midground, no matter where you were in the house. This is the winter garden, the, the entrance to the house, and you can sort of see how there's always this kind of layering of, of what we ended up calling the lily pads and also oblique views above or below. Above what you see is the outdoor dining room. Below is the main dining room. And also uh, a cadence of ascent. So you, you get to climb up these stairs and sort of graze your hand on the underside of the piece as you enter the, the outdoor dining. Here's where I wanted my laser pointer. This is the plan you, uh, you enter here. That's the winter garden that we spoke of. Dining room and kitchen, living room. A kid's wing with two bedrooms and a playroom. A parent's wing with a master bedroom, bathroom and wardrobe, and then a garage and a gym. Upstairs, here's that stair that you just saw, an outdoor dining room, an office for him and a studio for her. The site is an agricultural field, and our client had a, a, a very strong emotional attachment to the agricultural uh, aspect of his site. So we thought that an interesting way to deal with that uh, would be, we were sort of inspired by, by this painting by Edward Hopper, where the agricultural field right, comes right up to the edge of the house. We thought, that's amazing. It's almost like a carpet or floor treatment and, and we thought that in our case we would just drape it over the entire house as if it were a fabric and also we we needed to sort of approach these concrete 
artifacts with a conventional architecture uh, because they're not on their own able to be to house space. So here the, the inspiration came from uh, my time in Rome where you know there's these building laws and uh, there's sort of bylaws in Rome which as you're excavating to build whatever it might be probably something quite banal uh, and if you encounter an archaeological artifact you have to stop everyone has to stop and then you have to acknowledge that artifact in some way usually with these beautiful crisp glass boxes and then surrounding it is the most banal office tower you've ever seen and I always thought that was just such a powerful tension and so here uh, we, we treated the, the concrete pieces in the same way. Some of them are inside, some of them are outside, and we sort of thought of them as found artifacts as if we almost had a, a schizophrenic approach. One of me made them and another one pretended to just find them and build a, a kind of modernist architecture around them. This is the site. Uh, so here is footage taken while we were pouring the two biggest ones. One of them is 10 meters tall and the other nine. Um, and I'm giving you this because it gives a, the, the grayness of the sky and the sort of dour nature of the day. That's Vancouver most of the time. The sort of, it's raining all the time and it's gray. So one of the things that we thought is that the trees that we plant should have a bright color. And so we, at first we proposed cherry blossoms or magnolias, but later we thought maples, dark red. Carving away at the sort of, let's call it a modernist box to selectively show parts of the concrete pieces. And being very deliberate with skylights. In this case, we're bathing the lily, pad, the lily pad with south sun. Over here, there's a westerly facing slot so that um, as the sun sets, it sort of grazes the underside of this piece in the dining room. Uh, a wood layer to sort of warm it up because it's so aggressive. These are beautiful pictures that were taking while it was getting built. And I wanted to show them here because to me, this is the best the project ever was. Before there was windows and doors. There's an abstraction to it. It's almost like sculptures. See what I mean? Because I included some current photography as well. Spaces were at their most powerful before there was any kind of hint that this might be something people inhabit. Here you go. This is the this is that entrance. So this will be this will be a, a winter garden with succulents and cacti, gigantic cacti. But you can sort of see how how clean it feels. Almost uh, a disappointment. Almost a disappointment. It's still great. Here's that uh, dining room kitchen sorry these are these are taken with my phone so it's not professionally shot yet that's the living room and here you see them starting to move in furniture and this picture there you go those are those maples as big as we could possibly get being lifted into the lily pads. So uh, that was um, quite a risky thing for our client to undertake. And, uh, and uh, the sort of incremental approach to risk that I presented worked because I proposed to build one first and abandon it, the idea uh, if it didn't work out, it turned out to be not that expensive. And so our client was comfortable moving forward. It's weird because when we're working on our object based work, we are the ones who determine which risks are worth taking. But as an architect, you find yourself in this awkward role of selling risk, being a salesperson for risk. Um, 
and at se and for for 75 we were good at it and our client was open for 91 our clients made very clear from the beginning that they were only able to accept a certain level of risk they were quite aware of our portfolio and loved it but they thought that the risk should be limited to one aspect of the building and um, that it should more or less be a conventional tried and true building uh, and so the site we begin with the site oops, 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 oops. pause 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 All right. So it's a, a, a Galliano Island is a, a part of the Gulf Island archipelago outside on the westerly coast of British Columbia. It's a it was giant old growth forests that had been extensively logged. So these are second growth forests or third growth forests, and they cascade into the Pacific Ocean in this kind of amazing way. I should pause here because you can see there's a kind of gully between two rock formations. There's a big one here and another one there, uh, which is a very kind of strong characteristic of the site. So you, you sort of ascend to the top of a rock shelf, descend into the fern gully, back up onto another rock shelf, and then cascade into the water here. And you see these are very characteristic of the region. They're called Gary Oaks, and they're protected rare trees. And you can imagine the most magnificent sunsets. So the classic West Coast modern approach would be to site the building on the lower rock shelf so that all the spaces could have view, uh, which we explored, but we decided against it. We decided instead to site the building perpendicular to the line of the water. And our interest was that you could experience a cr almost a cross section of all the different conditions on the site. First the forest, then the gully, then the rock shelf, then the water. In section, the building is a house. And so a person traveling through this bridge, uh, sorry, is a bridge, uh -huh, um, never changes elevation. You never go up down or downstairs, but the site changes elevation all around you. And we really enjoyed considering this bridge as part of a, a larger sort of uh, figure eight shaped walk that we established on the site. You sort of make your way through the house, up through the courtyard onto the roof, back down into the fern gully, over to the water and back in. The our clients here are a couple whose kids are leaving for university. So their brief to us was to um, imagine a house for two. Really, it's a house for two, but a house that can expand when their kids are home or when they invite guests. And so there's a, a first an entry corridor. You enter here. Along the side is a big storage bank with a coat room, uh, bunk beds, a day bed, a bar and a what we call a booth, breakfast booth, and an ensuite bathroom, a little bathroom, all facing the fern gully. And you make your way, you reach the main space of the house, that's the kitchen, dining room, and living room with a fireplace, and your focus is on the water. Turn the corner, and this is the, the parents' bedroom with a large uh, bathroom and uh, wardrobe space. And that has a kind of oblique view to the water, but um, an intense focus on the Gary Oaks. If the kids are home or if guests are invited, from this little door, you can go on either of these bridges. So you have to go outside to go back in. And here there's a little bedroom with a bathroom for a couple facing this view. Or another bedroom, two bedrooms, I should say, with a bathroom, more for a family. Sort of facing that view. 
punctured the plan with a courtyard. The idea there being that it's the only place where you look up. The whole house has got a very horizontal configuration and the one moment where you realize you're on the bridge is the courtyard. You, you look up at the tree canopy or down below into the fern gu gully. There it is. So the one part that our clients felt comfortable about sort of our exploration, our material exploration approach was to do with the cladding. And we were always inspired by these stacks of lumber. Um, lumber is a primary industry in, in Vancouver and BC. And these stacks of lumber are a ubiquitous thing that you see when you live in that part of the world. We love them. And so the process we explored has to do with sandblasting. It's another super conventional thing that you see in our region a lot to clean lum uh, uh, forestry equi equipment or shipping equipment. And all we did is sandblast very thick pieces of wood to make, to make the cladding of the house. And it's interesting because you can see how uh, the older cedar has a very tighter, a very tight grain that results in a less pleasing uh, cladding, whereas the young cedar has this much wider grain, which has a much more graphic quality. Because of climate change, all the cedars are dying in BC, and uh, it's kind of a tragedy. But what it means is that cedar is abundantly available, and the young cedars especially are, are extremely inexpensive. So. It made sense for us to use this material. And our original intent was to, in the case of where, wherever we had a, a window or a door, our original intent was to sandblast the portal right through the three inches of wood and get this amazing live edge. But that felt like too much, too much for our clients. So the windows are all rectangles. Uh, climate change. So. We anticipate that in the next 100 years, sea level will rise and the Fern Gully will be flooded and the house will become a real bridge. And I think that's the best thing about this project. So it'll, it'll be shallow, it'll be like a tidal pool ecosystem. But I think at that point, the house will really become what it needs to be. And there it is. They're they're building the the bridge. I'll end with ninety four. Governor's Point is a strange finger of land off the coast of of Washington State, just across the border from Canada. The nice thing about it is that it's um, it's west of the railroad tracks, so. The west coast of the North American continent is dominated by a condition which has the railroad tracks adjacent to the waterfront, right from Alaska all the way to California. And it's sad because those, these, the most majestic sites always have a train passing in front of them. But in this case, the, the entire finger of land is, is uh, west of the railroad tracks. And it's, it's been mired in litigation for 50 years or longer. Uh, there was a developer in the 50s or 60s who had a proposal to cover it with 260 suburban houses, got a building permit, uh, and then the municipality changed their mind, realized how awful that is, cut off the developer's water. He sued them, and they were in court for decades. Finally, everyone ran out of money and the site went up for sale and it was purchased by my client who proposed to gift most of it, 80% 80, 80 of it, uh, to the community as a conservancy reserve, uh, a land reserve with a communal boat, do boat dock in exchange for uh, permission to build 16 houses on the westerly side of Governor's Point. There's a really slow video of the site, which I'll try to zoom through because you'll probably get bored. 
just to give you a sense of the magnificence of the landscape. So the first, the first house is uh, we're applying for a building co building permit day after tomorrow, I believe. Is that right? Very soon. Um, our intent was, as you arrive, to not see anything. So this will just feel like this is a permeable surface, so you're not even aware that you can drive over it, and you'll just sort of see landscape. This is a green roof with skylights. So your approach is kind of up here. But in fact, what's happening is the house is basically suspended over the edge of the cliff. And that's only because the setback lines are still grandfathered from when the litigation began 50 years ago or whenever. So what I'm after here is that you your approach to the house and your first encounter with the house is akin to entering a cave. You're, you have the feeling of going underground but then you find yourself suspended on the edge of a cliff. So that's that's you entering from that sort of sunken courtyard. There's two wings to the house. This is the public wing. You come in, there's an entry room, a kitchen, dining room, up a few stairs into a living room that's got the most uh, intense cantilever of the plan. This shape is the shape of the setback. So we, we hugged the setback as closely as we possibly could, which gave the house its geometry. Over here, uh, there's a few steps that descend and take you down uh, a um, corridor into a little office. And that's separated from the living room by a, a permeable shelf in this position here. So people here are about two feet lower than people here. And then uh, a small caretaker suite over here. And then you have to go outside, but undercover to enter the bedroom wing, which is starts here. Uh, that's the bedroom there with a wardrobe, another wardrobe here, bathroom, and then a bath on the edge of the cliff again, and a shower on the other side. Oh, I, I guess I offered a zoom a zoomed in plan. So back to the cedars. So everyone's cutting down all these majestic cedars now because they're dead. But what I learned is that when, when you process cedar for lumber, actually the lumber begins four or five feet up the, the tree. This part, which is called the burl, is, you, is discarded or sometimes mulched because the grain pattern is too inconsistent to make for reliably um, straight lumber. And so the, there are these uh, burls that are available, and it, it's astonishing because they're the best part of the wood. They're the, the tightest grain, strongest part of the tree, but they're, they're being mulched, they're being discarded. And so the idea that we started with is to take all these burls and do something with them. And uh, here's a, a machine we, we developed which has us chopping the burl into little chunks with a chainsaw and then throwing them into this tumbler, which if you've ever played with a, a rock tumbler as a kid, you'll know that when rocks, in this case wood rocks, are tumbled against each other and the, the bed of this machine is sandpaper, they slowly soften. And uh, I also included this video here because it's funny which is one of our first trials uh, where they where they sort of miscalculated the speed that it needs to go. I just love it. <laughs> yeah. 
so that didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> but you, you sort of see what we're, we're after here. You take the burl of the tree, you turn it into these, what we call wood potatoes. The wood potatoes, potatoes are bundled, and then uh, we cast a foundation right to the, prop, to the setback line off the edge of the cliff, set up a scaffold, take the wood the potato bundles, pop them on the scaffold, pour concrete around them. Then now they have been soaked in concrete for 28 days, so they're effectively petrified. And then we take them and mount them on the outside of the building as cladding. Here's a prototype of what the potato cast concrete might look like. And these are model images showing what we hope the cladding could feel like. But you can imagine that over 10, 20 years, all these wood potatoes will get a patina of moss and lichens. It'll be a kind of green. Birds will live in them. That's it. <laughs>